so we'll be discussing about copd and every aspects every aspect related to copd so first we'll understand what is the definition of the copd definition of copd is very easy it is irreversible chronic inflammation of the airway with a difficulty in expiration so patient has difficulty mainly in the expiration because we all know that inspiration is an act, is active process that is filling of lungs with the air is an active process where expiration is a passive process so basically the problem in obstructive disease whether it is, it is asthma copd bronchitis or small airway bronchiolitis the problem is basically in expiration so it is a chronic irreversible inflammation of the airway leading to the difficulty in expiration now if we compare and contrast it with the asthma it is also inflammation of the airways but it is acute reversible inflammation of the airway so in asthma we have acute here we have chronic in asthma we, we have reversibility in, in copd we don't we don't we don't have re reversibility so when we do pft in case of asthma we do an additional test that is called as bronchodilator reversibility test now we when we calculate we calculate fev1 upon fvc now if this value comes to be x and after giving of the bronchodilator this value increases by 12% that means it is a positive uh, positive reversibility reversibility is present that means it is one of the diagnostic criteria of asthma whereas in case of copd if you do fev1 by fvc and it came to be x and after giving bronchodilator you will see there will be a marginal or minor increase in the fev1 by fvc ratio that can become just like x plus 2 or x plus 3 so for uh, fulfilling the criteria of reversibility there should be a increase of fev1 by fvc by 12 percent which is seen in cases of asthma but not in copd earlier this reversible instead of this 12 percent it was 20 percent which was given so now but it has been brought to the 12 percent so this was regarding the definition of the copd now coming to the pathogenesis what is the pathogenesis of copd now regarding pathogenesis first we have to understand about goblet cell See, goblet cells are normally present in the airway and the base main function of the goblet cell is to secrete mucus. They are also present in the intestine, that is small intestine and even in the colon, there, where they also secrete mucus. So somehow, there are different reasons, for example, due to smoking or due to uh, exposure to toxins or because of alpha-1 trypsin deficiency, these goblet cells increases in size and increases in number so increase in size is called as the so increase in size that is hyper increase in number is hyperplasia and there is also increase in the size so size and number both are increased in case of the goblet cell so there will be increased mucus production and when there will be increased mucus production that will lead to the blockage of the airway blockage of the airway so when airway will be blocked what will happen now the patient has already difficulty in expiration then there will be further blockage during expiration so the uh, expiration part will will be more challenging for the patient to carry on therefore increased mucus production is very disastrous for this patient secondly this mucus can give rise to the development of the infection and thus can lead to exacerbation of the copd so this was regarding the goblet cell which now you must be knowing that in case of uh, crohn's disease or in cases of the ulcerative colitis these goblet cells decreases in size as well as the number because of which there is decreased mucus in the intestine part and there is increased ulcer so one of the so they are here they are increasing in size and the number leading to increased mucus production which can leading to infection plus obstruction in case of Crohn's disease and ulcers and, and ulcerative colitis there is decreased goblet cell mucus secretion and that that is causing mm, ulcers second is pulmonary artery 
it has been seen that patient of COPD there is because of different interleukokines and cytokines the endothelium of the pulmonary artery undergoes several changes and which lead to and there is increase in the resistant resistance of resistance in pulmonary artery due uh, due of resistance in pulmonary artery for the blood flow therefore there is development of pulmonary artery hypertension so in copd there is pulmonary artery hypertension because of which right ventricle has to generate additional work to pump the blood present in the right ventricle which lead to right ventricle hypertrophy and finally right ventricular dysfunction and this is what is known as core pulmonary core pulmonary is nothing it is called as the pulmonary heart the exact meaning of core pulmonary is pulmonary heart that is because the whenever there is a right heart failure because of the primary problem in the lungs then it is called as the core pulmonary please keep this in mind that if the right heart failure has developed after the left heart failure then it will not be called as a core pulmonary if the uh, right heart failing failing is fail, failure has developed after the uh, after congenital problem in the uh, lungs then it will be not called as the core pulmonary so these two things are not in core pulmonary this we have to understand so this was the second thing which developed in co pd third big there is increased protease increased protease increased trypsin trypsinogen and other oxidants they destroy the airway wall and when airway wall is destroyed what happen their elasticity decreases compliance decreases and their ability to expand decreases also there is decrease in the elastic recoil we all have just read that inspiration is an active process and expiration is a passive process so inspiration is not affected much but this elastic recoil which is responsible for the uh, expiration is decreased to a large amount and thus there is difficulty in expiration and patient is not able to expire properly and does some amount of air remains inside the lungs alveoli after every expiration which will read uh, uh, after some time which develops auto peep which has lot of which create lots of problem in this patients and also because the patient is not able to expire completely with each respiration volumes like residual volume total lung capacity they goes on increasing causing the hyperinflation of the lungs and this is the cause that on the chest x-ray we see hyperinflated lung and this is the cause cause we see barrel shaped chest now we'll discuss what is barrel barrel shaped chest so what is barrel shaped chest so what is barrel shaped chest normally we have a anterior posterior diameter and we have a transverse diameter the transverse diameter of a person is more than the anterior posterior diameter but because of this hyperinflation what i have told you just what happen is that anterior posterior diameter goes on increasing and of time comes when anterior posterior diameter is same as that of the transverse diameter at this time we say that anterior posterior diameter is equal to the transverse diameter and that is this value is equal to the 1 then after some time anterior posterior diameter becomes more than the transverse diameter and at this time the anterior posterior diameter upon transverse diameter value is more than 1 these condition is known as barrel shaped chest so barrel shaped chest is called when 
the anterior posterior diameter of the person is more than the transverse diameter and the cause i have already explained in pathogenesis why this why this is why there is hyperinflation okay now coming to something which is very important in pathogenesis is this the edema what is the cause of edema in, in the patients of copd so earlier it was thought that because of the right heart failure that is the core pulmonary development is the cause of the pulmonary edema but now it has been proved and seen in a lot of cases that there are lot of copd patient who have developed edema without right heart failure or without core pulmonary so if we classify we'll see the cause of edema in copd patient is of it is because of the three reasons the first reason is of course core pulmonary core pulmonary as i have already told that it is the right heart failure secondary to the lungs problem but that lung problem should not be congenital and also the right heart failure secondary to the left heart failure is not taken as a core pulmonary second is the renal hypoxia second cause they say renal hypoxia and the third cause say they say is increased co2 now how this thing happened we have to understand a concept that is known as pre sphincter capillary pre sphincter capillary now if this is your arteriole this is your venule this is arteriovenous shunt and there are lot of capillaries coming out of it okay and these capillaries have a sphincter before them and this sphincter is known as pre capillary sphincter this sphincter is known as pre capillary sphincter so this is your arteriole this is your venule this is the arteriovenous shunt and there are a lot of capillaries coming out through this arteriovenous shunt and the sphincter present between these capillaries called as a pre uh, capillary sphincter now they are highly responsible to the co2 now so in cases in copd when carbon dioxide increases they act on these pre capillary sphincters and they causes relaxation of the pre capillary sphincter so blood will move in these capillary and these high amount of blood in the capillaries will leak out leading to the edema so it is the modern theory they say the edema in copd is because of the pre capillary sphincter which are highly sensitive to the co2 value and when co2 is increases in the uh, copd patient it relaxes the pre capillary sphincter and more amount of blood flowing in the capillaries and there is a uh, edema so this is one of the cause so core pulmonary and the second cause is renal hypoxia the exact mechanism how renal hypoxia causes edema is not known so we understand there are three causes one is core pulmonary second is the renal hypoxia and third is the increased co2 leading to the pre capillary sphincter please remember these pre capillary sphincter were first diagnosed in 1950 in mesenteric circulation then in 2020 after 50 years they were diagnosed in brain circulation and a lot of studies have happened on them and they has that has proved that these pre capillary sphincters make a important part of the brain hemostasis and auto regulation of the brain rely a lot on these pre capillary sphincter earlier this concept of pre capillary sphincter when came a lot of the books like gaitan genong's doesn't take them into, uh, them seriously but now once in 2020 they were developed in the they were discovered in the brain circulation and it was known that they help in auto regulation so now they have been they are now taking as taken as seriously so there are three causes for edema one is the core pulmonary old concept second is the renal hypoxia and third is the increased co2 leading to the relaxation of pre capillary sphincter and leading to edema now coming to the symptoms now generally you see copd after 35 to 40 years of age davidson says after 40 years of age but most of the books say that after 35 years 
there are two different types of spectrum one of the person will who will be in even five sigma group will have a different set of symptom and the second person who will be in chronic bronchitis chronic bronchitis will have different feet. these emphysema people are called as a pink puffers why are they called pink puffers because they are thin and dyspneic that is they will have dyspnea and they will be thin these are called as a pink puffer in chronic bronchitis these people will be called as a blue bloaters why because they will have they will be having polycythemia and edema they will having polycythemia and edema but in clinical practice there is a considerable amount of overlap between the pink puffers between the pink puffers and the blue bloaters so both can be seen but for classification wise we will say that emphysema people are pink puffers and they are thin and dyspneic and in chronic bronchitis they are blue bloater who have polycythemia and edema although considerable amount of overlap is seen among them this is the symptom now if i ask you about the physical findings physical findings see you have to understand something physical examination first point that i am writing is very important is it poorly correlates with lung function so physical examination poorly correlate with the lung function physical examination is non specific ye non specific bhi hota hai and it is seldom seen in advanced disease so it will be seldom seen in advanced disease therefore we should not be very much relying on the physical exam so these are the three points regarding the physical examination that they poorly correlate with the lung function and they are non specific and seldom seen in advanced disease advanced disease mein ho sakta hai mil jaye ya na mil pae theek hai so this is very important now coming to the one of the important thing that is auscultation a lot of our professors in our mbbs they used to ask about auscultation so generally auscultation it is quiet you will not see anything if you see crackles then they can be permanent crack and they can be temporary temporary crackles can be because of the infection and once the infection is cured they are gone but if the crackles are permanent then we should think of bronchi ectasis this is a very important point regarding physical examination that generally on auscultation in copd patient uh, chest will be quiet but if if at all anything is present then it can be presence of the crackles and crackles if are present temporary that means they, it is a infection and if it is a present permanently then you should think of bronchi ectasis where you should go for hrct which is the investigation of choice in cases of bronchi ectasis this was regarding auscultation also you will see barrel shaped chest that i have already told you where anterior posterior diameter will be equal to or more than the transverse diameter so this was regarding the auscultation now very important point regarding clubbing note no there is no clubbing in copd so copd patient does not have clubbing if clubbing is present in a patient of diagnosed copd you should think of two thing one is lung fibrosis and second is lung carcinoma this is also very important point and check the lot in mcqs that clubbing is absent in copd but if the clubbing is present then you should think of two thing either you should think of the lung fibrosis or you should think of the lung carcinoma so this was regarding the physical findings important point symptoms and the physical finding now very important criteria we all know that is in 2008 there was a criteria which was known as gold criteria or in 2010 nice criteria 
both were same they group the copd patient into into three group into four groups one two three four one was the one way of classification was fev1 by fvc and it was less than 70% less than 70% less than 70% less than 70% because every anyone who has fev1 but fvc less than 70 was diagnosed with copd and so this will be same in all the four grade grade 1 to now further classification will be dependent upon fev1 if it is more than 80% grade 1 then 50 to 79% grade 2 then 30 to 49% and less, less than 30% so this is the we can say gold criteria of 2008 or we can say the nice criteria of 2009 then there is a very important criteria that is called as a board criteria board criteria now why board criteria was made this board criteria was made in order to know the severity of the copd that what is the severity of the copd and what it will be the related mortality more the board number more will be the severity more will be the mortality and morbidity of that patient so if you want to compare two patient of copd then you can calculate the board number because that will indirectly tell you the severity of the disease and thus indirectly tell you the uh, mortality of that patient so board criteria start from 0 1 2 and 3 where B means BMI that is body mass index. So body mass index 0 means more than 21, it is less than 21. Here body mass index is not taken. Then O, O is for obstruction. Now how will you see obstruction? D is for dyspnea and E is for exercise. So obstruction you will see on the basis of FEV1. FEV1 more than 65% grade 0. Then 50 to 64% grade 2. Then 36 to 49% and less than or equal to 35%. This was the second obstruction. Was, so obstruction was measured on the basis of FEV1. Then dyspnea. Abhi aapko, I will teach you as MRC scaling of Disney and cases of COPD. So that I will tell you there are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 grade. So 0 and 1 grade will be in 1, then 1 grade, uh, then grade 2 MRC, then grade 3 MRC and grade 4. This is Disney is measured on the basis of MRC scaling, that is Medical Research Council. So it has classified Disney into 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 part. So 0 and 1 are taken in zero classification of board two is taken in classification one of the board three is taken as classification two of the board and four is taken in the classification three of the board this then exercise if he can walk more than 350 meter it is zero if he can walk 250 to 349 meter two if he can walk 150 to 249 meter if he can walk less than or equal to one 49 meter so this is how you will calculate the board criteria of a patient more the criteria more will be the mortality and you can compare two patient now i have told you about the mrc classification that is the medical research council classification now we'll see what is this what is this mrc classification mrc classification It is Medical Research Council classification of dyspnea. See, in this we start from 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4. In 0, patient is not dyspnea. There is no dyspnea present in the patient. Patient is alright. And in this stage 1, dyspnea is present when patient walks on hills when patient walks on hill there is presence of dyspnea or when the patient runs even slowly if he runs there is a dyspnea so 
so this is so in grade 1 of mrc patient develops dyspnea if the patient walks on the hill or if he runs even slowly in grade 2 he walks slowly why he walks slowly because he knows from the contemporaries because if other people are walking at an 2 meter per second speed then he will walk at 1 meter per second because he knows that if he will walk at that speed he will develop dyspnea so grade 2 patient of grade 2 will tell you that I generally walk at a lesser speed as compared to my counterpart just to prevent myself from getting dyspnea so this is what grade 2 now coming to the grade 3 grade 3 will become dyspnea in while walking less than 100 meter within 100 meter of walking he will become dyspnea now coming to the grade 4 grade 4 is you can see dyspnea on this patient will become dyspnea on undressing or dressing undressing or dressing both can lead to the dyspnea of the patient so this is very important criteria so now after coming these three classifications we will move further away in COPD now we will see some of the investigations that are required in investigations some investigations So, first investigation that we will see is regarding the eosinophil count. Please remember, we also do eosinophil kind of count in asthma. If a person has a more eosinophil count in asthma, then there is more chances of development of bronchospasm, especially intraoperatively. Again, I am telling the same thing that if more the eosinophil count in an asthma patient, then there are more chances of landing him or her in bronchospasm especially intraoperatively now what is the role of isnophil in copd in copd if the isnophil count is more they will respond better to ics that is inhaled corticosteroids if the isnophil count is less they will response their response will be not as expected with the inhaled corticosteroids so more the isnophil count in copd more will be the uh, response to the inhaled corticosteroid spread lesser the isnophil lesser is the response so this is regarding the isnophil second is albumin we all know that albumin is an independent risk factor for post operative complication in any this any operation any surgery in copd if the albumin is less than 3.5 then it is an independent risk factor for post op complication therefore albumin should be or must be made at 3.5 or more in cases of the surgery to prevent post-operative complications. Third is PFT. So first thing we have to understand pulmonary function test. What we will get? In pulmonary function test, we all know, please remember the vital capacity will be normal to low. So this is one of the capacity in case of COPD which is normal to low. Generally it is low. So this is asked a lot. Which of the following capacity will be normal to low? Answer will be vital capacity. Then total lung capacity will be normal to high. FRC is increased. We all know residual volume is increased. Now I will tell you about the ratio which is asked a lot. The ratio is residual volume upon total lung capacity. This value increases in COPD. This is very highly specific for COPD. The value of residual volume to total lung capacity increases in COPD. So if they ask you value which decreases, vital capacity, value which remains normal or increased, TLC. Then there will be increase in the FRC, increase in the residual volume. And residual volume upon TLC increases. This is very important. You should remember this. If you want to remember just one, remember this. RV by TLC. Because this is asked a lot. Okay. This was the regarding the PFT. So we have isnophil counts, albumin, PFT. Now we'll go for ABG. Now when to go for the ABG? ABG is already all is done if the patient is using oxygen or you are suspecting VQ mismatch. Otherwise, there is no need of ABG in 
patient of COPD. Now, PFT, one thing I've, I've told you about PFT this, but one thing I've told you that when will you order PFT in a patient of COPD preoperatively? First, there are certain criteria. First, if it is the pulmonologist, pulmonologist, if the pulmonologist has asked you to do so, if the pulmonologist say that go for a PFT, then you should go for a PFT. Otherwise, if there is a decreased oxygen, so what is the value of oxygen? At what oxygen value will go for the? So it is the P50. That is will be the 55 mm of Hg. Below 55 mm of Hg, we have to go for the PFT. Or if it is an acidosis, that is. PaCO2 is more than 50 or bicarb is more than 33. Please remember these values. So if we'll go for PFT, if the pulmonologist has indication of PFT in COPD is a separate topic. I'm teaching you this here. That indication of PFT is that is pulmonologist has ordered it. Second, if there is a decrease oxygen that is P, uh, P, uh, that PO2 is less than 55 mm of Hg. Or if there is acidosis, acidosis will be in the form of increased PaCO2 or increased bicarb. So PaCO2 more than 50 or bicarb more than 33. Or you are going for a pneumonectomy surgery. If you are going for a pneumonectomy surgery. Or patient is in respiratory distress or there is a history of hospitalization within three months. So three, these are the indication for PFT. This you should be very much clear. So these were the indication that albumin, we go albumin, isnophil, ABG, PFT. Now one test very important is that is alpha one antitrypsin. We have just read that symptoms of COPD will come after thirty five years. On diabetes, say 40 years, but if the symptoms of COPD develops within 10 years or 20 years or 25 years, then that will be said that that will be said as a premature development of COPD. Then in those cases, we should go for the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency level. Because if this value is low, then trip then they because their function is to destroy the trypsin and other proteolytic enzymes so when they their activity will be low and trypsin and other proteolytic enzyme will destroy the airway leading to the emphysema and copd like features therefore whenever the copd symptoms develops below 10 will at 10 years 20 years or 25 years that is below 30 years of age one should go for the alpha 1 antitrypsin <coughs> value and a value less than 70 mg per dl suggest its deficiency so this you have to understand but there are certain cases where alpha 1 antitrypsin may be low why low because maybe it is not forming in cases of acute hepatitis in cases of acute hepatitis you will see a low or the patient has a malnutrition malnutrition because this alpha 1 antitrypsin is formed in the Liver. In acute hepatitis, liver is not forming malnutrition, it is not getting. And if it if all things are good, there can be nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome, all the alpha 1 antitrypsin will be gone in the urine. Second, there can be condition where all the alpha 1 antitrypsin can be gone in the GI tract. That is called as menetrial disease. That is called as protein losing entropathy, protein PLE, protein losing, that is called as menetrial disease. Not many years disease, it is many tears disease. Then there are certain conditions in which there will be increased alpha one in no alpha one antitrypsin value. What are these? In case of infarct, if a patient has developed infarct, in cases of inflammation, because it is also a marker of inflammation, it will increase in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Patient taking OCP, if the patient is pregnant and in SLE. So these are the condition where so you have to interpret the result of alpha 1 antitrypsin very meticulously. Okay. So this was regarding well, alpha 1. This was the test. Now other tests that we can do. 
now other test there are certain tests which are bedside test bedside test now the first bedside test is the cuff test cuff cuff what happen in cuff test in cuff test will ask the patient to take a deep inspiration and after deep inspiration what we will do we will ask the patient to cuff normally normal patient will cuff and then there will be no progressive cuff but in case of copd or in case of especially bronchitis when the patient after taking deep inspiration the when the patient will cuff then there will be subsequent 2 3 4 and other cuffs which means positive cuff test and it is seen in cases of bronchitis this is seen in cases of bronchitis in bronchitis you will see this cuff test second is the wheeze test wheeze wheeze test wheeze in wheeze test the patient is asked to take five inspiration and expiration and after that he is auscultated between the shoulder between the two shoulder blade that is scapula and if there is a presence of wheeze if wheeze is present then this test will be called as a positive test and the patient will be, be having copd features third is a maximum laryngeal height it is the maximum laryngeal height laryngeal height but in larynx which part is used for this test thyroid cartilage is used thyroid cartilage is used so what is whenever no example if this is your thyroid cartilage and this is your supra sternal notch whenever patient expire lungs comes up up and there is a distance between the thyroid top of the thyroid cartilage and supra sternal notch so during expiration this is always more than 4 cm in a normal person so in a normal person the top of the thyroid cartilage and supra sternal notch the distance is more than 4 cm but if in a patient after a complete expiration the distance between supra sternal notch and thyroid cartilage is less than 4 cm then that is showing obstructive pattern and patient may be a, a patient of copd then other test that you can perform is a forced expiratory volume you allow the patient to inspire completely and after that you ask the patient to expire if expiration expiration time is more than 6 seconds then it is says that fe v1 is less than 50% and patient is moderate to severe copd so these are the bed tests one is the cuff test i have told you then i have told you the wheez test then i have told you mlh that is maximum laryngeal height where larynx ka thyroid cartilage is used 4 cm is the mark and then we have fevn that is forced expiratory volume if it is expiration occurs for more than 6 second and fevn is there then we all know a test that is called as a bht that is a breath holding time in this we ask the patient to inspire completely and hold his breath and we'll put our stethoscope at the neck in front of the trachea in order to notice the first expiration because there are certain time where person start expiring but it is not evident when when we are looking from the outside so it is always mandatory to keep your stethoscope in front of the neck and to watch for the early expiration sign now if this bht is more than 40 seconds then it is normal very important point bht more if it is 30 to 40 it is unequivocal unequivocal that means this may be normal may not be normal 20 to 40 that means cardio pulmonary cardio pulmonary compromise is present mild to moderate cardio pulmonary compromise is present mild to moderate cardio pulmonary if it is less than 20 that means severe cardio pulmonary compromise is present so if it so by breath holding time more than 40 second that means normal 30 to 40 second that means unequivocal 20 to 40 that means cardiopulmonary cardiopulmonary compromise is present uh, and that is mild to moderate and less than 20 it is severe cardiopulmonary compromise so these are some bedside test which you can do 
I have told you the normal test plus I have told you the bedside test which you can do in patients of the COPD. Now, so by this we can diagnose the COPD patient. I have told you Gold's criteria, NICE criteria, MRC criteria, Bode's criteria, everything. Now, how will you treat these patients? The first important thing is related to cigarettes in these patients. Related to cigarettes. Now, very important is first we have to under, understand what does cigarette causes in the body. First thing. Second, we have to understand how to treat the, these patients who are taking cigarettes, pharmacotherapy. I will teach you in detail about the pharmacotherapy of the cigarettes. And third, what is the best time to leave cigarette if the person has to undergo a operation? So these things plus we will also combine seek cigarette and carboxyhemoglobin physiology and try to understand how carboxyhemoglobin is formed, what are its different as aspects. So all these things will be seen in this order. So what does cigarette cause? See, cigarettes affect on CVS system, cardiovascular system. So you will see it has basically two effects. It increases catecholamines. When catecholamines will be increased like adrenaline or adrenaline dopamine, what happens? Heart rate will increase. BP will increase. So what will happen? Workload on heart will increase. Okay. So heart can go into the heart failure. This is the one thing. And if the patient is already compromised, then heart can have a decompensated heart failure. So this is one thing. That is increased catecholamine. Second, it is a vasoconstrictor. This causes vasoconstriction of coronary artery which can lead to MI. Very important point. So it can cause increased catecholamine which can cause increased heart rate, increased BP, increased workload on the heart and can cause heart failure. Secondly, vasoconstriction and can cause MI. Secondly, it induces various hepatic enzymes. Various hepatic enzymes. So lot of drugs, so when it induces hepatic enzymes, so lot of drugs have to be given at a higher dose because this uh, induced enzymes uh, remove those drugs very quickly from the body. So this is one of the things. Third, it now on lungs, it has again two effects. Increases hyperreactivity, hyperreactivity of the lungs. That means the airway of the lungs become hyperreactive. That may that means that even a small stimulus can lead to the bronchoconstriction, increased mucus formation, increased air, airway wall edema. So they causes hyperreactivity, and it causes increased mucus production that we have already seen. It decreases immunity. It decreases immunity. And it decreases ciliary function. Okay. This immunity is when, when we uh, do cigarette smoking, this immunity decreases and it turns to the normal value when we quit cigarette for six weeks. This is very important and asked a lot. When we quit for six weeks, then this immunity comes to the normal value. This cigarette also decreases wound healing capacity. Wound healing capacity. Plus it can, it is also carcinogenic as we all know that it can cause bladder carcinoma, it can cause lung carcinoma, it can cause uh, blood carcinoma, cancers. So all this is the normal effect of cigarettes. We have to understand what is the normal effect of the cigarette. Now what does cigarette do? Cigarette forms COHB that is carboxyhemoglobin. We know that normally oxygen dissociation curve is sigmoidal shape. But when carboxyhemoglobin is formed, the shape is like this. That means carboxyhemoglobin turns the oxygen dissociation curve to the left side. 
Now, if we just talk of oxygen dissociation curve, it can go to the left side, it can go to the right side. If it goes to the left side, that means there is increased affinity of oxygen plus hemoglobin. Or we can say P50 is decreased. P50 is the pressure at which 50% of the hemoglobin are saturated with oxygen. So, more the P50, lesser is the affinity of oxygen and hemoglobin. So, it left means increased affinity of oxygen with hemoglobin or decreased P50 and we see this effect as an Haldane effect. And this occurs at alveoli level because there oxygen has to come inside the blood and carbon dioxide has to go out. Hmm. Now just opposite in right side there will be decreased affinity of oxygen with the hemoglobin or we can say P50 will increase. And this effect will be called as a Bohr's effect. Which effect? Bohr's effect. Now, the cause for the right shift we all know is increased temperature. 2, 3, 2, 3 dpg. Increase, increase temperature. Increase CO2. And here, the causes is carboxyhemoglobin. Decreased temperature. Decrease 2, 3 dpg. Now, we have to understand very importantly that when carboxy hemoglobin is formed, that is due to smoking, the curve shift to the left side. When curve shift to the left side, what will happen to the P50 value? P50 value will decrease. Yes, so carboxy hemoglobin poisoning or carboxy hemoglobin formation after taking cigarette, there is a decrease in P50 value. Now, once we stop cigarette smoking or once we treat the increased COHB, what will happen? This P50 will increase because COHB will decrease. So, this is a very important question that is asked and very confusion that effect of COHB or cigarette smoking on P50 value. So, when you are using cigarette, then what happens? P50 will decrease because COHB will turn... A sigmoid, a sigmoid curve into a hyperbolic curve to the left side so p50 will decrease but when you stop smoking or you use 100 percent oxygen cohb will decrease and thus p50 will increase therefore during the treatment of carboxy hemoglobin or cigarette smoking when we give oxygen p50 value increase this is a very important point that we have to understand so this is what uh, cigarettes do to the body now so when to stop, it is said there are two very important points, first and second. That cigarette smoking, maximum effect of quitting cigarette before preoperatively is 8 weeks. That is if you stop smoking 8 weeks before operation, then it will give you, it is of maximum utility. Therefore, most of the guidelines say that cigarette should be stopped at 6 to 8 weeks preoperatively. If we stop cigarette, now there is a second thing, which is just uh, contrary to this. If we stop cigarette smoking 7 to 10 days back before the operation, then what happens? There is increased anxiety, increased chances of depression, increased mucus production, which can lead to increased post-op pulmonary complication. And also, it can lead to decreased A patient is not able to decreased stress condition. Patient is not able to go through the stress condition. So there is a decreased capabilities to undergo stress condition. So these are the four things that happen. That is increased anxiety, uh, increased depression, increase mucus production and decrease capabilities to undergo through the stress condition. In spite of above two contrary experience uh, statement, it is said by most of the book that you should encourage the person to stop having cigarettes, stop having cigarette in your first encounter to the patient. If you encounter the patient before five days, then also you say stop. 
if you encounter eight weeks before the surgery then you have to say stop so first is the eight week maximum utility seven to ten days these will be problem but the final what the book says that you have to ask the person to stop the cigarette smoking in your first meeting you have to stop cigarette smoking in your first meeting okay now how to what are the pharmacotherapy which you can use to stop the cigarette smoking so coming to the pharmacotherapy this is very easy i'll tell you a very easy diagram by which you can write it and you can also treat the person who want to quit smoking we can use two drugs one is buprepeon and other is perini clean perini clean and other is buprepion buprepion and other is verini clean so what happens is you have to divide your treatment part in 12 weeks these 12 week will be further divided into 4 4 and 4 week 4 weeks 4 weeks and 4 weeks this 4 week is divided into two part first week and then the remaining three week okay this first week will be divided into first second and third day then fourth fifth sixth and seventh day and then again it will go for the three weeks so if we talk of now if we talk of the bopre pion if we talk of the bopre pion then the dose on the first two three one second and third days will be 150 mg od and from the fourth to seven days the dose will be 150 mg bd and this dose will continue in the next three weeks then the next four weeks and then the next four weeks but what person has to do so 150 mg od on the first second and third day then on fourth fifth sixth and seventh day 150 mg bd and this dose will be uh, will be continuing through third week and the fourth week and then the fourth week total of twelfth week okay but what has the person has to do person will not stop will, will not quit smoking till in the first week he has to drink he has to uh, smoke whatever amount of smoking he does in the first second in the first week but after the first week in the initial three week he has to stop smoking 50 percent for example if he used to uh, have 20 cigarettes a day so now he has to drink he has to uh, smoke just 10 cigarettes in the next four four week he has to further remove 50 percent of the cigarettes from his life that is now 50% of 10 is 5. So now he will all so he will just smoke 5 cigarettes in this 4 weeks. And in the last 4 weeks, there will be complete abstinence. Complete abstinence will be there. So in the first week, he has to smoke whatever he used to smoke. Then in the ne next third week, 50% reduction. In the next 4 weeks, 50% reduction of the previous one and complete abstinence in the fourth week. This is how pharmacotherapy or buprepion is done. Now again 12 week will divide into 4 week, 4 week, 4 week total of 12 week. This four week is divided first into first week, which is divided into first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and third. It is divided into third week, three week, then four week, and then four week completely twelve week. Now, vernisline will be started in the first, second, and third day. You will be giving 0.5 mg OD. So vernicline, you will be giving 0.5 mg OD in the first, second, and the third day. And in the 4th, 5th and the 6th day, you will be giving 0.5 mg BD. And in the from the 
second week till the end of the till the 12 week you will give 1 mg bd so again i am telling you in the first second and third day you will give 0.5 mg od in the fourth fifth and sixth and seventh days in the first week you will give 0.5 mg bd and from the second week till the 12 week you will give 1 mg bd and what the person has to do person will not stop smoking in this first week and in this third in these three week he has to decrease the smoking by 50% for example if he was smoking 20 now he will smoke just 10 and in this four week he has to bring further 50% down that is if he was now 10 from 10 he will be smoking just 5 and in the fourth week there will be complete abstinence complete abstinence will be there this is we have to understand very importantly so this is the pharmacotherapy how you use in case of cigarette smoking so this is one of the most important what cigarette do to your body how when to ask patient to stop smoking how to give pharmacotherapy to the patient now so we have to go on for the investigation now we'll come to the management part management part the initial thing was cigarette which i have told you in the great detail i think you must be understanding second is the oxygen role of oxygen so first we'll understand when we have to give oxygen in a copd patient so always remember this 55 a p a o2 of less than 55 or hematocrit of more than 55 or presence of core pulmonal these are the indication where you have to give oxygen therapy and it has to be started through nasal cannula at 2 liter per minute so when you have to give oxygen therapy when po2 less than 55 hematocrit is more than 55 and or core pulmonary earlier it was the concept that pao2 should be maintained at 50 to 55 but it is no, doesn't hold good to Now PaO two should be or equal to made ninety mm of Hg. Okay, so when we will give oxygen, oxygen will be giving when PaO two will be less than fifty five. For hematocrit, more will be more than hematocrit is just the hemoglobin multiplied by three. Hematocrit more than fifty five or coal per mil. It has been shown that if we give oxygen in this following cases, there will be decreased polycythemia incidence. there will be decrease pulmonary artery hypertension this is very important point okay so this is regarding the oxygen therapy now some vaccination guidelines have also come for the copd patient and you have to under, remember just two that is annual influenza vaccine every year you have to take influenza vaccine because there is high chances of the infection and when the influenza infection occurs to the copd person it can develop copd exacerbation that we will be seeing after some time annual influenza vaccine second pneumococcal vaccination so this is must for copd patient now in drugs we can use inhaled corticosteroids we can use beta agonists like salbutamol then we can use muscarinic antagonist ipratropium bromide antiatropium bromide okay ipratropium bromide and inhaled corticosteroid we can use fluticasone Luni, Solid, then Baclomethazone, then Budesonide, then Mometazone, and Triemcyclinone. These are the six inhaled corticosteroids. We all know that corticosteroids can cause. oropharyngeal candidiasis 
then oropharyngeal candidiasis secondly it can cause myopathy of the laryngeal muscles and it can cause dysphonia therefore they are only combined with the beta agonist because their side effect decreases like example salbutamol then we can also add epratropimbromide and diapropimbromide now systemic or oral steroids are not given in copd they are given in case of exacerbation of the copd so again i am telling this line that systemic or oral steroids are not given in copd they are given during exacerbation of the copd now so we have the these thing now there can be edema in patient of copd and i have told you what is the cause that is renal hypoxia pre sphincter pre capillary sphincter and curve can we give diuretics please remember if you will give diuretic like if you given furosemide what will happen there will be hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis please remember the only diuretic which causes acidosis is acetazolamide acetazolamide ac so you can remember ac acidosis causes acetazolamide whenever you give an uh, diuretic for example furosemide it will decrease will cause decreased toric metabolic alkalosis so what will be the problem with this if there will be decrease the chloride decrease metabolic alkalosis whenever there is a decreased chloride along with the metabolic alkalosis the furosemide action to remove water is blocked okay so diuretic is doing a good thing that furosemide is causing hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis by re removing the water but slowly when this develops it uh, stops the action of the furosemide that is a feedback it acts like a feedback loop so it stops the diuretic action of the furosemide therefore after some time you will see that the edema that initial it you will get a good response but after some time you will not get a good response for the edema so furosemide initial will give a good response afterward you will not see a good response this is what i wanted to tell you Mm. now there are or there are some surgeries one is the lung reduction surgery other is lung transplantation lung transplantation still is a very futuristic thing in india but most some of the countries are doing lung transplantation and it is it requires a lot of experts lung reduction surgery is done in which the if for example if this area is hyper inflated with blood blood then this can be removed this is what is known as a lung reduction surgery so the area above it can now easily relaxes so what happens is during lung reduction surgery the areas with blebs or areas whose elastic tissues have been destroyed or hyper inflated areas are removed so the uh, left out areas has a, has a increased compliance increased elastic recoil and there is a increased vq matching these are the three points which you have to remember whenever there is a lung lung uh, reduction surgery there is increased compliance of the left out area increased elastic recoil and increased vq matching is there so that they are beneficial there are newly surgeries in which what they do they use cylindrical shaped stunts and through bronchoscopy they keep these stunts in the into the areas which are prone to collapse like in emphysema or in copd so this is one of the novel way in which bronchoscopic mediated cylindrical stents are kept in the airways in order to prevent their collapse or pre prevent their bronchospasm we all know that these copd patient have a high chances of going to the bronchospasm so we have to study when a copd patient develops bronchospasm how to treat it that that can develop intraoperatively or can develop at any point of time 
so the we can remember first thing that we will use be using will be salbutamol now what is the salbutamol if you are doing nebulization with the salbutamol the dose is 5 to 10 mg 5 to 10 mg is the dose in case of pediatric population less than 2.5 years less than 5 years more than 5 years less than 5 years 2.5 mg more than 5 years 5 mg that is 5 years and above we can go for the adult dose like 5 mg so this is the nebulizing dose this nebulization can cause tachycardia that can cause tachypnea that can cause tremor that can cause hypokalemia so these are the four side effect that you should know tachycardia tachypnea tremors and hypokalemia also you can use iv that is parenteral in case of adult or in case of pediatric population what is the dose this is very important point because if salbutamol nebulization is not working you can use iv in adult the dose is 250 micrograms slowly over 5 to 10 minutes and then we can also give a infusion dose that is 5 microgram per minute this is very important point in pediatric the loading dose is 4 microgram per kg and maintenance dose is 0.1 to 1 microgram per kg per minute so this is very important how what is the dose of salbutamol what is the nebulizing dose of salbutamol and what is the iv dose of the salbutamol after coming to salbutamol we can go for hydrocortisone hydrocortisone and to give hydrocortisone simple rule follow age 1 to 5 year less than 1 year then 6 to 12 year and then more than 12 year or you can say adult 1 to 5 remember 50 mg 6 hourly less than 1 years 25 mg 6 hourly 6 to 12 years 100 mg 6 hourly and then 12 more than 12 years 200 mg 12 6 hourly so this is how you can remember the hydrocortisone dose Now coming third therapy you can give is magnesium sulfate. We know that in a vial of magnesium, in a vial of magnesium it is 50% that is 500 mg per ml. So in 2 ml we have 1000 mg or we can say 1 gram of magnesium or we can say 4 millimoles of elemental calcium or we can say 8 magnesium or we can say 8 milli equivalent of elemental magnesium this is just for your knowledge purpose that how is the vial of magnesium what the vial of magnesium contains it is of 2 ml 50 percent it is 500 mg per ml that means 2 ml contains 1000 mg that is 1 gram so one vial contains 1 gram of magnesium sulfate or 4 millimoles of elemental magnesium or 8 milliequivalent of elemental magnesium. So in adults, you can give 2 gram of magnesium sulfate that is 2 ampules in 100 ml over 15 minutes. Very important. In cases of pediatric population, in cases of pediatric population what will you give the dose is 50 mg per kg okay so this was regarding magnesium please remember magnesium can cause sedation can cause hypotension and cause feeling of worms okay and at higher doses it can cause decreased reflex acute renal failure respiratory arrest and cardiac arrest cardiac arrest occurs at 25 milli equivalent respiratory arrest occurs at 12 acute renal failure occur around 16 and decreased reflex occurs after 8 milli equivalent per liter so these are the side effects of magnesium
Now also what you can use in bronchospasm, you can use ketamine and the dose is 10 to 30 mg. Okay. Then you can use aminophile. It is a methylxanthine. Dose is 5.7 mg per kg loading dose followed by 0.25 mg per minute. It has a low therapeutic index. Therefore, it should be our last resort. So, aminophilin, it is a methylxanthine. What is the mechanism of action of aminophilin? It decreases, what causes it increases catecholamines. So, when catecholamines will increase, what will happen? That will cause bronchodilation. Secondly, it increases cyclic AMP. It is a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor. So, increasing that will cause bronchodilation. Third, it blocks adenosine we know that adenosine is a bronchoconstrictor and adenosine is a vasodilator so adenosine is a vasodilator bronchoconstriction so here these methylxanthine blocks adenosine so there the bronchoconstriction is a stop so aminophilin is a very good drug they all come under the methylxanthines methylxanthines which consist of caffeine theophylline then aminophilin then drug dairy phylin. So caffeine is a, we know that coffee, theophylin, we all know. It. What is aminophylin? Aminophylin is nothing but 2 is to 1, that is 2 ratio of theophylin and 1 ratio of EDTA. This is the aminophylin. And what is dairy phylin? Dairy phylin is a combination of theophylin plus etophylin. Etophylin is 77 mg and theophylline is 23 mg. So this is dairy phylline. So one ampule of dairy phylline consists of theophylline 23 mg and 77 mg etophylline. Then what is aminophylline? Aminophylline is a 2 to 1 ratio of theophylline that is 2 ratio of theophylline and 1 ratio of EDT. And theophylline is a pure form and caffeine. So now we are use aminophylline and dairy phylline. They have a narrow uh, uh, Therapeutic index. They they can cause arrhythmias. So it is very important to note that methylxanthine. If a patient is methylxanthine, you should not use halothane because halothanes, we know that it sensitizes the heart to the activity of the catecholamines, and these methylxanthines xanthine increases catecholamine, so that can cause arrhythmia. Uh, chronic use of these methylxanthine can also cause nervousness, nervousness, anxiety, difficulty in uh, having sleep and if the person sleep there is decreased restorative, restorative sleep that is NREM sleep will be less so these will be the problems with these methylxanthines now coming to the adrenaline we can also use we are used, uh, giving the treatment of bronchospasm what we can do we can give adrenaline so adrenaline Normally 1 is to 1000 means 1 mg per ml. So when we are giving nebulization, please remember we don't need to dilute it. And it is it is 5 mg or 5 ml in adults. Okay. In pediatric population, the dose is 0.5 ml or 0.5 mg per kg maximum to 5 mg or 5 ml. So this is a nebulization dose. We have to know that we don't need to do the uh, we don't need to add NS or anything. It we don't need to nebulize. Now coming to the IV. So IV dose, IV adult dose, and IV pediatric dose. What is the adult dose? Adult dose is 10 to 100 microgram and pediatric dose is 0.1 to 1 microgram. These are IV dose. Okay. So how will you give? You know that there is 1 is to 1000 of uh, adrenaline you will take 1 ml of this and you will add 9 ml of NS. Now what will be formed? Now that now it will be not, now it will be 1 is to 10,000. 
ओके दैट मीन्स पॉइंट फाइव एम जी पर एम एल और यू कैन से इट इज हंड्रेड माइक्रोग्राम पर एम एल एंड वी नो द डोज इन एडल्ट इज टेन टू हंड्रेड माइक्रोग्राम सो इफ विल गिव वन एम एल दैट इट विल भी हंड्रेड माइक्रोग्राम इफ विल गिव इन पॉइंट वन दैट विल भी टेन माइक्रोग्राम सो इसकी हम डोज कितनी निकाल लेंगे पॉइंट वन एम एल और वन एम एल दैट विल बी द डोज सो आफ्टर फर्स्ट टाइम डायल्यूटिंग इट विद नाइन एम एल वॉट वी गेट इज वन इज टू टेन थाउजेंड दैट इज पॉइंट वन एम जी पर एम एल और हंड्रेड माइक्रोग्राम पर एम एल एंड सेल द डोज इज टेन टू हंड्रेड माइक्रोग्राम सो वी विल यूज ओनली वन एम एल और पॉइंट वन एम एल इफ यूल इफ विल बी यूजिंग पॉइंट वन एम एल दैट मीन्स टेन माइक्रोग्राम एंड इफ वी आर यूजिंग वन एम एल दैट मीन्स वी आर गिविंग हंड्रेड माइक्रोग्राम सो दिस इज हाउ यू गिव इन एडल्ट नाउ इफ यू डू द डबल डायल्यूशन दैट इज यू टेक दिस वन एम एल of this one is to ten thousand and add nine ml of n s then what will happen then it will become one is to one lakh that is point zero one mg per ml or ten microgram per ml now the adult the pediatric dose is point one to one microgram per kg now so here it is 10 microgram per ml and we have to give what 1 microgram for 1 microgram what we will do we have to give just 0.1 ml and for 0.1 microgram we have to give 0.01 ml you are understanding or not if you have to give 1 microgram we have to just give 1 ml because there are 10 microgram per ml so in 1 ml there will be only 1 microgram if you have to give 1 microgram so in in point 1 ml there will be 1 microgram so you can give point 1 ml if we want to give 10 microgram if we want to give point 1 microgram then we will give point 01 ml per kg so this is how you understand so after double dilution we can take point 1 ml per kg or point 01 ml per kg because see the dose in pediatric is point 1 sip 1 microgram per kg Now, after double dilution, the concentration of adrenaline is ten microgram per ml. So that means for one microgram we need point one ml. So that is point one ml per kg. For point one microgram we need point zero one ml. So we have a zero point zero one ml per kg. So this is the how you so simply you have to understand the adult dose is ten to hundred microgram. The pediatric dose is point one to one microgram. For giving adult dose you have to dilute it once for Uh, for giving pediatric dose you have to dilute it twice so this is how you have to give the adult this is the treatment of the bronchospasm now very important thing regarding the copd is the ventilation ventilation part ventilation part in copd we give ventilation tidal volume is given As six mL per kg, this kg is actually ideal body weight. How is ideal body weight calculated? For male, it is fifty point five, and for female, it is forty five point five plus two point three plus two point three into x into x. What is x? This x is the inches above five feet. This x is the inches above five. For example, if a person is male person is Five foot five inch. That means we'll write fifty point five plus two point three into five foot five inch. So x will be inches above five feet. That will be five. So that will be fifty point five plus five to fifteen, one five to six or one seven. That is seven point five. That means it will be fifty eight. So ideal body weight for that person will be fifty eight. This is. So six mL per kg when we say this per kg is in the ideal body weight. What I have told you. Similarly for the female, that is forty five point one plus two point three into x, where x is the inches above five feet. So this is the tidal volume. Respiratory rate or I E ratio should be kept low. Third, saturation should be maintained lump sum around ninety percent. We don't need a hundred percent saturation. and peak pressure should be less than 30 cm of water and humidified humidified gas should be used 
because if humidified gas will be not used then there can formation of mucus plug which can cause spasm secondly it can also can be a point of infection so this is the ventilation now there is something which is called as auto peep which develops in the patient of copd so what is auto peep we will see if this is an alveoli we all know that inspiration is active expiration is passive so when air comes in during inspiration and during expiration when air goes out what happen these wall are weak their compliance is weak and they compress therefore some amount of air that is going outside is trapped with each expiration some amount of gas is trapped for example in first expiration there will be 0.5 ml of gas is trapped in second expiration 10 ml so slowly 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 when they reach to a value of 100 ml or more then what happen they start putting a pressure and this pressure is called as auto peep and this auto peep can compress the neighboring vessels and can lead to decreased venous return and can even cause blood pressure hypotension so this is what is what is auto peep so auto peep develops because there is difficulty in expiration and with each expiration some amount of air is left which goes on accumulating with each expiration and finally we get a, what is auto peep now how will we diagnose that this auto auto peep has developed this is very important now we know that in most of the ventilator we have what we have a flow time loop like this this is a normal flow time loop that is this is inspiration this is the expiration once the expiration is stopped next inspiration is start this is the first cycle this is the first cycle this is the second cycle now this was perfectly fine now see this flow time loop this is the inspiration this is the expiration now see before the inspiration before the expiration is able to touch this baseline next inspiration is start so before this expiration that means the next inspiration starts before the expiration has end then this is a sign which is telling us that it's having auto peep so if your ventilator is showing flow time curve then by just seeing the expiratory graph you can understand that there is auto peep secondly there is something called as a flow volume loop in a normal flow volume loop there will be inspiration and expiration will come and touch this base point but in case of auto peep it will remains like this so this is also telling about the auto peep so this is a flow volume loop this is the flow time loop so in both of them you can easily diagnose auto peep now this auto peep we know that auto peep can develop hypotension so there is something which is known as apnea test with the help of the apnea test you can diagnose the auto peep what will happen just uh, we know that there is a expiratory limb and there is a inspiratory limb remove the expiratory limb of the ventilation so what will happen and look for 30 seconds if bp increases that means that patient has a auto peep because we know that auto peep is causing compressing the neighboring vessels due to which there will be decreased bp so once we have removed the expiratory part then the auto peep that has generated itself will come out because of the pressure that has created that will come out through the ventilator and now the compression on the air, on the neighboring vessels will be low so the bp will again rise so this is known as the apnea test so apnea test is a confirm almost confirmatory test that auto so you can use on the flow time curve and the flow volume curve plus you can do apnea testing in these patients so how will you treat this patient the treatment part is that you have to decrease the respiratory rate you have to decrease the ie ratio you have to decrease the tidal volume to increase the peak and you have to increase the peak inspiratory flow rate
these are the four things that you can do what are the things decrease the respiratory rate decrease ie ratio decrease tidal volume and increase peak expiratory flow rate these things you can do here now there are certain things we have to understand that what are the pre op things there are what are the pre op things which can increase pulmonary complication so post op pulmonary complication please remember these are divided into patient related patient related if, you, if i if i ask you patient related what can be the example if age of the patient is more than 65 years he is a smoker he is ac grade 2 he is having copd he is have, having cardiac dysfunctions these are the five a64 is smoker smoker itself means ac grade 2 then patient is having copd then then surgery related and anesthesia related anesthesia related if you are giving ga please note that giving of ga itself increases the post op pulmonary complication and second ga for more than 2.5 years it increases the post op complication so the new uh, books of anesthesia have mentioned that ga itself increases the post op complication and giving of ga about 2.5 years increases the post op complication rate then surgery if the surgery is emergency surgeries because the patient is not taken care of nicely second head and neck surgery then vascular surgeries etc etc okay these are the things so how to decrease by decreasing pre op we have to do pre op incentive spirometer very important second cessation of smoking smoking cessation is very important then keep regional anesthesia techniques or neurexial anesthesia technique should be used and if finally ga should be used so initially we should go for regional anesthesia technique if it is if it is not useful then go for the neurexial technique then ga this is the order that we have to follow then these are thing incentive spirometry you will give you will give cessation of smoking then type of anesthesia will be used then pain analgesia is a very important part in post and in the masters trial which was a randomized prospective trial it showed that thoracic epidural analgesia which was using local anesthesia plus uh, opioids a small amount of opioid have drastically decreases the post op complication rate so i am again tell telling you that this master trial which was a randomized uh, prospective trial has shown that epidural analgesia in which in the form of local anesthesia plus small amount of opioid had decreased the post operative pulmonary complication so pain has to be taken care of intraoperatively as well as post operatively and very important is we have to start mobilization and incentive spirometry as soon as possible post operatively and the drugs that the patient has is taking should be started as soon as possible so these are the things that you can take and very important you know that albumin albumin less than 3.5 itself is a risk factor for post op complication therefore in old patient or patient having multiple risk factor for post operative pulmonary complication albumin should be made at 3.5 and then we should proceed for the surgery if it is an elective surgery so these are the things related to the copd which i have told you and i think uh, you people are now well versed in copd